So is it okay to have questions about faith? Because some Christians say we shouldn't be asking questions. The truth is the truth. And uh, to use a cliche, the truth will out. If we truly believe that there is an intelligent God who speaks in sentences and paragraphs to his people through his word, the Bible, and uh, gloriously through the created order, we, we really believe he is who he says he is, an omnipotent, omniscient uh, 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 God, then he can take any question that we have. Uh, we don't need to run from uh, our, uh, away from our doubts, but run to them. So questions are good. Uh, as a matter of fact, that is the singular genius of Christianity is to invite those questions. Um, this is what Jesus did after the resurrection. He invited questions. He, he held his hands out to, to Thomas and invited investigation. This has always been the spirit of Christianity and it is the testimony of the leading giants in the history of the faith. Look at St. Augustine, for example. He began in doubt. He didn't believe the faith of his mother, Monica. Eventually, through asking hard questions of the Bible and about himself, he came back to faith. Another preeminent example of this is, is C.S. Lewis, who came to Oxford University talking to people like J.R.R. Tolkien as an atheist, as a skeptic. It was through tough, iterative series of asking tough questions that Lewis uh, came to faith. Hard won faith. He felt as though there was nowhere else to go. That's what this is all about, is helping people to be able to be open about questions and looking for answers. Love it. Oh, your oh thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, some Christians think, just give me Jesus. Give me the New Testament. They don't think that much about the Old Testament. They don't think it's relevant at all. So what do you say to that? I think the challenge for a lot of people is that the Old Testament uh, is a narrative that uh, people think is too, has miracles. It has all these crazy uh, events like a flood in the Exodus, you know, seas parting. And so they compare it to, let's say, Hercules, you know, uh, myths of the Greek mythology. Sure. And, and I know that you played Hercules. For seven years I did, you know, and uh, yeah, I can see and I have seen that from other people, and they say, well, look, what, what you do with Hercules, that was mythology, and that was because people are trying to figure out why the sun does what it does, why the seasons change, why we have, you know, tornadoes, earthquakes, whatever it may be. So they were created gods that they believed in that were causing these things to happen. So people do, they compare that. They say that the Bible is a myth, just like mythology is. Right, and, and I think the, the interesting thing is all around the world there were varied gods that people worshipped. So what was the difference about this god? this particular God that these Jewish people, uh, these Israelites worshiped, that, that met Moses at the burning bush. And that was what intrigued me. Here's some menus for you too. Thank Can I get you. refills on your water? I'm good. I'm good too, good. yep. Perfect. Right, so the Old Testament and the New Testament, obviously, are connected. So Moses is supposed to have written the first five books of the Bible. And those books are foundational to all the other books. So if Moses didn't exist, then the rest of the Bible is based on nothing. There are many people who don't see a connection between the Old and New Testament. I had a panel discussion in New York City about patterns of evidence, the Exodus. Listen to what Anne Graham Lotz had to share at that event. So Anne, the, the plagues that were visited upon the Egyptians led directly to the Exodus, but how does the Exodus story relate to us today? You know, when you saw in the film that cloud coming down and the firstborn of anyone who wasn't under the blood of the lamb that was on the doorpost, whether it was animal or Egyptian, uh, the life was taken of the firstborn. And, uh, and then when Jesus comes along, John the Baptist says, here's the lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. And people knew they were talking about the Passover lamb that would be sacrificed, that when we're under the blood of the lamb, we're saved from God's judgment for our sin. So that the story of Passover has enormous meaning to us today, not just um, what God did in the Old Testament and in the, the Torah, but 
what he's done in the New Testament through Jesus Christ, that we, we can be saved from the judgment that is coming because God's judgment falls on all of us. We're all sinners. And therefore, we claim the blood of the Lamb. And when we're under his blood, claim the death of Jesus to make atonement for our sin, then we're saved from God's judgment. So there's this direct correlation between that event in the Exodus and the story of Christ dying on the cross. So that's where the Old Testament and New Testament obviously connect to each other. Right. And what you see is that, that there's this chronological narrative that the Bible has, and it basically tells about the creation of man and then the fall from, of man, and then it talks about this Savior coming. That's the story of the New Testament, right? the story of Jesus Christ coming to save the world. And so most people are focused on that latter story. They don't really understand the first part, but Jesus connected it all. He talked about it and he said that, you know, if you don't understand or believe in Moses and the prophets, then you won't understand who I am. And so if there was no Moses and if there was no Exodus and all these other books are referencing it, then what does that do to the Bible? Again, listen to what Anne Graham Lotz had to share. You know, if you go through the Psalms and the prophets, you would have to cut out huge pieces if you said the Exodus didn't take place. And then I look in the New Testament, and Jesus referred to elements. He referred to uh, the burning bush. He referred to the manna that came from heaven. He referred to the serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness. The Apostle Paul, when he was writing to the Corinthians, talked about all the children passing through the sea on dry ground. The writer to Hebrews, uh, twice, but, but in Hebrews 11, it commends the Israelites for their faith that they, they passed through the Red Sea on dry ground. Talks about Rahab and, and Jericho. And so, if that's not true, then it's like dominoes that fall and, and the scripture just begins to collapse all the way through. And so there's a lot of evidence besides just in archaeology and history. There's evidence within scripture itself in, in the words of Jesus. If I were counseling somebody who wanted to have faith, I would say start with the words of Jesus and, and you have to take a step of faith somewhere. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and what he speaks is the truth. So let's just start with his words. So if he believed in the Exodus, then why wouldn't I?